Hello, everybody. Welcome into Debate Night once again. We're back with another episode, new topics, um, new analysts on the show. It should be a great show. We have some interesting questions to answer this week. I'm excited to get everybody's feedback on. Uh, Brody is here after some mild technical difficulties just mild. yeah you know old microphone maybe i've been yelling into it too much so just said no more uh new microphone here but man of the people we're back uh first thing gotta address a couple things yes last year or well, last week we were talking about Myth- Macbeth's post about his migraine uh what i have heard from a bunch of people it was not about why he lost. It was more to tell people why he didn't stick around for autographs. So I am sorry. I stand corrected on that. And also Noah, this is like one of the top comments. Noah said, you guys say random tree in the fairway. Like they put it there overnight or something. Do we just want landing zones that have no obstacles? Having trees and landing zones makes you make a decision on how far to throw and placement of your disc, which is what I thought Brody wanted. It's the same thing as a force carry to my eyes. An obstacle that makes you make a decision. Don't want to be in the tree? Throw it a little wider, maybe even shorter. Such a soft take in my eyes. Well, Noah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I missed this one. This was my fault last week. I said random tree in the fairway. In fact, it's not a random tree in the fairway. You're 100% right. Uh, Ricky should have thrown a little bit farther or he should have thrown shorter. Uh, So you are correct. Not a random tree in the fairway. Very big. Very big. Um, let me ask you something, Brody, if a player, um, mentions ailments in their post and maybe ties them to something other than their performance, but just throws them in there. Do you think that maybe they're trying to put them in there for a reason or, or no? I mean, if I, after I, uh, let's say lost a really close match said, Hey guys, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to stick around for photos and autographs. I had explosive diarrhea and immediately had to run to a toilet. Um, I'm probably not saying that to let people know why I wasn't able to sign. But what if you said, I've been dealing with this and this all day long. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I'm just reading what people are telling me that he yeah. was not making excuse at all. I, it was I simply it was, just I, to tell people why he couldn't I just do thought autographs. it was really funny that our whole, like, topic uh, of discussion was that, like, he had an echo chamber, and then it happened in our comment section right after. Um, anyways. But, I mean, that's the thing. is At the end of the day, that's what fandom is. Fans are always going to – I mean, heck, there's still people that think I can win on tour. I'm one of them. And here's another one. Well, there you go. Hunter's the other one. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) There's a difference between capable and likely to. I think you're capable of winning on tour. Oh. I mean, people think I'm going to win Letchdown next tomorrow or two days from now. Count me in. Could happen. It could. Dark horse pick. We'll see. Hunter will do it. (laughs) Hunter's here. He's got the warmest light of anybody by far. Said, what do you want me to do about it? No, that's good. It's it's cozy. I not was not an insult. I it just, I think I it just an observation. Warmer. That was just <laughs> that was just an observation. Your lighting's fine. It's just warm, which I like. Thank you, man. Well, I'm not gonna make any excuses because apparently excuses don't go well with this podcast. So I'm here. Nope. Are you trying to warm your light, Brody? <laughs> um, <laughs> Ross is here as well. Um, I was just telling Brody, did you ever watch? Um, sorry to put Ross on the spot here. Brody, did you ever watch Friends? Gossip yes. Girl? Oh, absolutely not. Or the new show, You, that was on Netflix. Oh, I like You a lot, yeah. Does he not look like Penn Badgley, the main guy? Oh, yeah, serial like, killer, come on. dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I started with Gossip Girl. He's not a, he's not a serial killer. Oh, Brody does have a warmer light. <laughs> yeah, he got warmer. <laughs> Brody anyway. might be sunburned. <laughs> Ross made time to join us in between all of his Netflix shoots. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, not happy Happy to be here. Excited to be here. You know, this is a project that I'm passionate about. Aside from all the other things I'm working on, and, <laughs> and Brody, I do have to say, you you said my take for the European Open uh, winners was a, a Ross dress for less take. At Isaac Robinson and Chris Dickerson, they finished fourth and fifth. Not too bad, if I do say so myself. Mm, tough week for Brody. <laughs> well, we're we're patting ourselves on the back for picking a top five player. Wow, all you right. Ross oh. dressed for less, Tim. Maybe yeah. it was a compliment. You deserve I this. love Ross Dress for Less. I also do love Ross Dress for Less. Two guys in the top five. All That's right. impressive. Two guys that you said were hey, terrible hey, picks. A year, a year from now, I'm going to say, hey, name the top five at the European Open last. And we'll, <laughs> I'll give you each $100 if you can name 
all five people in the European now Open. Now that you challenge me, I will. Yeah, miss. Hunter's going to be. No, no, you will forget. To, I will you not. You will forget just like everyone else. I'm going to wake up every morning. Those going to be my affirmations <laughs> in the mirror. Just go over them. Um, and then lastly, Dustin is also joining us. Um, some would say the superior, Dustin. Yeah, I mean, that's what most say, but I don't know that for <laughs> sure. Um, I will say that um, I can't even remember what I had for lunch. So there's no way I'm getting 100 bucks from Brody. So it's just a lost cause for me. But glad to be back and uh, ready to roll this thing. So let's go. All right. Let's jump right in. Without any further ado, enough sidetracking. Um, all right. So we're going to talk a little about this new course we just saw with the grand stage. Um, so now that we've seen the Town Song Festival course played during last weekend's event, do you think it will be a sufficient venue for the European major next season? Does it even have a fair chance to be successful given the circumstances of the makeshift tournament it will host? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Brody? What is What is the makeshift tournament? What does that mean? it means that they're basically plugging in a European major to fill in for the European open because they won't have the European open because that's where worlds is being hosted. So they're throwing a European major in there at this course. Well, here's, here's what I think is like, I think everyone loved the tournament from what I've heard. Uh, you know, players were even mentioning that they felt that it was uh, bigger than the European open the week prior. So this idea that this is like a makeshift tournament, I'm not really buying that at all. I think, uh, if anything, I think this is going to go so well that they're going to start thinking, hey, maybe we should move, like I was saying, maybe we should move the European Open and not have it in the same exact city, same exact uh, country every single year. Uh, I would love to see it bounce around and uh, to courses and venues that it can hold. Looking at this course, I mean, I think 100% can hold a major. Uh, the course itself I thought looked really nicely, uh, looked really nice. Had some really big shots, um, some cool features, elevation changes, uh, you know, nice trees looking in the park. I liked it. The infrastructure was incredible. So I'm sure the, the, you know, the people that worked on the course volunteers, all of those people would be up for the task. No problem. The stage that the players came in on it as an intro and also where they had the actual podium. I know you guys love talking about podiums. We don't have podiums in disc golf, but they said, by golly, we're going to give them a podium. So that was very, very nice. And, uh, you know, part three finishing hole, you guys know how I feel about that. I don't love part threes to finish it, but it did, uh, you know, as far as like shock value of that shot coming into the whole crowd, it was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, definitely a lot of good things going on at that event. Hunter, do you think that's enough to uh, help its case as a major next year? Yeah, I think in my opinion, the the best thing that the PDGA could do is just keep the European Open title and just tie it to this course. Because um, I think that where it'll get overlooked in the future years is kind of when we think back on like we've talked about like Kona Piche Day, the Aussie Open, stuff like that, where that tournament just doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I think that it's going to be received better if it's the European Open and you just have to remember, oh, it was that year that it was at this course versus, oh, why the heck did like they randomly just won a European championship or whatever they call it. I think that's what will end up making it feel like makeshift as the question has said. I think that keeping it saying the European Open would be better, but the PGA has alluded in the way they wrote that initial article that the European Open won't happen and that there will be some other European major, which points to, they must not be thinking the same way I am, but I think that would be their best bet there. As far as the course and everything, I think that the obvious, the, the infrastructure and the team behind this event is probably the best we have in disc golf or one of the best. I mean, the stage and everything they brought in, I love the podium. I'm a sucker for a good podium and having that with the background and all of that points to like this event is going to feel a like head and shoulders above 95% of events. The course itself, I don't know the full property because I do think that it just needs a little more teeth, whether that's extending the distance a little bit more or bringing more OB in. But a lot of the stuff that you can't fix, the team behind the event, the support of the community, all of that's there. The course is, in my opinion, one of the easiest things to fix. So they got a whole year to figure that out. Yeah, yeah, valid point. There, there are certain things you can't uh, change, and and a lot of them they have correct at that venue. I definitely agree with that. Uh, Ross, what are your thoughts on the Town Song Festival course? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, maybe it's just because it's uh, unique for a disc golf event. But watching it, it was just so much fun to watch. The energy was infectious. Uh, you know, even uh, pros in their posts were saying this is the most they've felt like a professional. Some players who have been playing. For years if not decades um as hunter hunter just said the team behind this uh, event 
is incredible. And the fact that this is the first year as a DGPT event, this is the, uh, the event they were able to put on. They could only go up from here in terms of everything surrounding the course. I think the course is, you know, honestly the least important aspect of the uh, the event. I mean, USDGC, we love Winthrop. If Winthrop was just like a regular DGPT event in April, probably wouldn't have the same hype. It's everything that surrounds the USDGC and its history, how you know, massive the crowds are, and just the you know the importance of, of that you know title of the event, just like the European Open, um, can really enhance it and make it something that you know pros and fans alike look forward to every single year. I do agree though that it probably shouldn't stay here. You know, an ideal rotation would be maybe between Crocol, the Monster, and this venue, just get it on a three-year rotation. Those are three iconic courses in Europe that highlight different aspects of European disc golf. Um, but I think next year I'm really looking forward to it. It should be a sick event. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with the the Winthrop point. Um, there's something to be said for, you know, as much as it's weird to think about a course not mattering with other things around it, the Winthrop property has nothing going for it on its own. It's what they create on that property. Um, Dustin, wrap it up for us. What do you think about this event? Uh, what it looking? What it's looking like next year? Yeah, well, I'll say this. I mean, I agree with what y'all are saying as far as the, the the leadership there and the groups that put that course together and put the event together did a great job. And it was fun to watch. And it's awesome to hear the players talk about how, you know, they felt like professionals for the first time. It looked like they really tried to, you know, make it something special, uh, make it memorable for the players to convince them to come back to do all those things. So as far as it being a sufficient venue, sure. Um, but, you know, all I hear about from disc golfers is, you know, it's not a competitive sport between players necessarily. It's always person versus the course. So I got to say that that course, if it was going to be a major every year, it was going to be a big time event. I don't think that course has enough teeth to be a true opponent of most of those pros out there. I think especially the more time they spend on that course, they're going to master it and just get better and better. And it didn't sound like I've never been there. Obviously, I don't know what the property looks like, but some of the comments I saw in some practice rounds said it didn't really feel like there's a whole lot they could do to really expand because they were working with a limited space. So I think. Yeah, it's going to be fine. They're going to do a great job. It's going to be a fun time for us to watch and enjoy. But I don't know if it was repeat year after year, if, if that course is going to stand up to the competition that's coming at it. Uh, but they'll do a great they'll do a great job. The one thing I was a little interested in and concerned about, it says this Estonia Song Festival, which is this big production they have there, all these music. It happens like two weeks before that tournament. And it's just they said over 100,000 people will be on that property to enjoy that 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 festival. So it'll be interesting to see how quickly they can turn that around to a good solid disc golf course and have the volunteer and people attend to make it something special. Yeah, that's a valid point. I mean, yeah, if you look up anything surrounding that event, uh, that song festival, I mean, I don't know much that goes on in that part of the country or that part of the earth, I should say. Uh, but that song festival seems like a super big deal. So that'll be interesting to see if there are any lasting effects. And I definitely wonder how tight it is the layout they're working with obviously whenever you're kind of working your way through you know that kind of park property there's only so much twists and turns you can throw in there brody would you have to add yeah i was just gonna add one more thing i think again the infrastructure that that course had i was very surprised and pleased because to me that course would look very similar to like a memorial course you're playing it in a park yeah the big difference there was literally Fans weren't just standing anywhere. They were standing behind fencing and fencing had advertisements on it and, and sponsorship and everything. And, and all of that matters. And I think that was, you know, we see some of it a little bit at like OTB with some of the infrastructure there. We see some of that USDGC as well. Um, but it's crazy how just a couple bleachers with fences and stuff, all of a sudden like kind of encompasses the event and it makes it feel like you're actually watching something versus oh these guys are playing a game in a park yeah yeah no it it, it it little goes a long way when it comes to um just bringing in things that look like they belong at a professional event i mean you look mm -hmm. at early disc golf footage and you literally just saw a small crowd following four guys at a park and there was not and, and a couple cameras and there's no uh nothing that 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 tells the viewer you are watching a pro sport and that that goes a long way for sure one thing um, i really liked about it too was the crowd had like 
somehow discussed that they were going to do the wave. I don't know if y'all saw that when like oh, Ricky threw yeah. over them and when the disc was over them, they were all were just like doing the wave Incredible. as it went over until it hit a lamppost and stayed OB. But like, <laughs> I love that. I don't know if that's something we got to like rehearse before USDGC or how you get everyone on one page, but that's that feels fun. like something that feels like something that should just become ingrained in disc golf fans. Like if it's, if a disc flies over your heads at any point, you just do the wave Woo-hoo. to follow it. Could be, you could do be need enough thing. people because that's kind of like weird if there's yeah, like 30 people, people in the, in the, out there like, whoa. <laughs> but if there's thousands, it looks sick. That's true. Okay. Did they well, say there was like 2,500 people? Is that what they I heard, I heard over 2,000. Yeah. And they were and they paid. All, they, they were all paid. paid. Yeah, yeah. Which is pretty good. Like 10 buck, 10 euros was the minimum or something like that. Yeah. I think so. I like um, it. Yeah. It was uh, it was a good time. Yeah. We might have to see who can start the wave at, at Worlds this year. That could be could be a mission try to get one of our guys to start one um, Somebody right. Silas thing. he's tall yeah they'd see him that's true you wouldn't miss it you wouldn't miss it if Silas started it um mm-hmm. all right so the european swing is finally over so now that the tour is finally headed stateside who is your big winner and big loser of the european swing um doesn't have to just be a player be as creative as you want um but man it has been a long european swing the longest one yet so there's been a lot of time to build this narrative um hunter who do you have you know, my initial gut went to Ganon Burr, and I wanted to kind of explain why I'm not picking Ganon Burr or Discmania because I went first here, so I don't have a chance to rebuttal anyone else. So in case someone else does, basically my thought process with Ganon was he kind of proved what we already knew, which is like he's the best player on the face of the planet right now. And so when he went over there, that kind of just proved it. So instead, I'm going with Paul Macbeth, I think is the biggest winner coming out of this European swing because I think he proved more so to himself than to fans that he can still compete, which I think was important because he started with the Swedish Open and he progressively got into harder fields and continued to compete. I think his worst finish over there was like sixth or something like that, but he had a podium at a major. And then what we saw importantly at the European Disc Golf Festival is that final round chargeback over the last, what was it, like the last 22 holes, he made up like nine or 10 strokes on Ricky. I think those are really important things for Paul to see and start to believe about himself as we head into the stretch that he historically has been dominant on of Ledgestone, Idlewild, Worlds at his own course, Maple Hill, GMC, all of that stuff. Um, and the flip side, the biggest loser, I'm going to go with MVP, mainly because they're the faces of their company, Simon Lazat and Eagle McMahon, um, just kind of were, were non-factors. I mean, Simon finished in eighth, I think, this past weekend, but he came in like 36th the European Open, and Eagle went 40th, 12th, 61st, 60th. Uh, I think MVP at this point is kind of like get us to the off season so that Eagle can figure out whatever's going on and hopefully be back next year. Yeah, definitely a bit of a flop for their uh, their European swing and not wrong about Paul uh, getting a nice running start as he heads towards this part of the tour. Uh, Ross, who's your big winner and big loser of the European swing? A uh, big winner has to be just disc golf. I think that this, this swing showed the future of disc golf, what events need to look like, um, what courses need to look like, what crowds need to look like. If you were, if I was to show, you know, one of my friends who does not follow disc golf, but is a sports fan, I would be showing them one of these events first because these are the most professional, biggest galleries and get to the most hyped for disc golf. And that Crocodile course, I'm obsessed with that course. I really hope that course uh, stays on tour. I think it's a gorgeous, challenging property. Um, the biggest loser is Prodigy Discs, in my opinion. Uh, their, their star European athlete, Vino, switching to Innova, getting a, uh, a podium finish at Crocodile in third, fifth at the European Disc Golf Festival with Innova on his back, not Prodigy. Uh, when I started playing disc golf, I always thought Europe was Prodigy and Discmania territory, and none of their athletes uh, performed very well in Europe. You know, Seppo, how big he is in Europe, it had a hand in designing the European Disc Golf Festival course it was just a you know a shame for prodigy that this you know really in, uh, the introduction of the european uh, swing and tour and what it can be really did not you know you wouldn't know prodigy how, how big it is in europe after this week so i definitely say prodigy is the biggest loser uh, after this european swing i like the unique picks i like picking disc golf as the big winner because hey that's a fair point we saw a lot of new standard for disc golf on the during this stretch uh dustin who are your big winner and big loser all right, I'm glad uh, Hunter took time to rebuttal because I am going to come back with Gannon Burr, but maybe not for the rest of reasons you think. Uh, you know, yeah, he, he played great while he was over there, but the biggest story to me, why I call him the biggest winner is 
this guy, well, he's like 19 years old. He's going over there. His dream was to win the European Tour. He talked about it a lot. He got to go. He took the early lead, and then that final day, he was on the same card with Paul McBeth and, and Ricky Wasaki, both of those guys who had a chance to run him down and to chase him, and he was able to hold him off and 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 play a great round that, that secured him that victory. I mean, it's kind of like me back in the 90s. You know, if I was got to play Michael Jordan, Larry Bird in, in the game of 21, and I pulled it out, you know, by like three points there at the end. It's just the excitement of that and what it does for his career. And, you know, careful with the word momentum here, but the momentum that it could put <laughs> not just to the rest of this year, but to the rest of his career. I mean, that's going to be a lifelong memory and a lifelong victory that he gets to take with him and really – uh, put towards, you know, the legacy that he's going to live. Um, loser, you know, maybe this is not fair, but Evelina, I got to go with her because, you know, she has some great finishes and all that stuff. But I just think about that final round of the European Open and how she collapsed and just terribly lost that thing. And then even at this uh, disc golf festival in Estonia where she was there in a playoff and she's known for throwing far and she gets there to what should have been an easy putt, I think. I mean, I think she would have made that and then puts it off the off the band. And I just think that's that's going to damage her psyche for the rest of the year, I got to imagine. I mean, I know she's done it before, but just those two back-to-backs and just in that European swing when she's at home, I just think that's tough to overcome. Yeah, good pick. I, I think Evelina and I have a similar um, range on putts where that length putt is not an easy putt, unfortunately, for us. Um, Brody, who was your big winner and big loser? Yeah, I mean, I think Evelina is actually not a – Bad choice if we kind of MIB'd ourselves after every single time she played to where we just kind of forgot <laughs> about what happened. Um, so I'll, uh, that's why I kind of will rebuttal against that. Surprisingly, I'm going to go a little bit against Hunter here in a second. We actually have contrasting winners and losers. So my big winner actually is Ricky Wysocki. I think Ricky is actually doing, uh, you know, Beginning of the season, you start asking who are the best players in the world. I don't think anyone mentions Ricky. I don't even think they mention him in the top five. If you go through the first like 10 events, there, I mean, you, everyone, it's shiny new toys, shiny new toys here and there, here and there. Uh, so I think this swing of the last three tournaments really has uh, stapled him into that discussion of like, hey, he is still one of those guys that can win every event he plays in. Uh, And the big loser for me, actually, I'm going to go complete contrast to Hunter. I'm going to say it's Paul Macbeth. Only because if he does not end up winning at all this season, he is going to look back on this three-week stretch of having a real good shot at all three tournaments to have won or to have won multiple times. I get what Hunter is saying. He's putting himself back into contention. But here's the thing. Paul Macbeth did not build a brand off of, Hey guys, I can maybe win or Hey guys, I can maybe go out there and have a chance to win. He built a brand off of I'm the best disc golfer. I win all the time. He didn't win any three of the last events that he put himself in contention to do uh, with also like, did anyone, if would anyone have bet five, six, seven, how many years do you want to go that he would have missed that putt on hole 18? And I'll leave that. We got to say about that big hunt. I think I think they're both very solid picks. I do think that the the Ricky pick, my only rebuttal there is I think it actually goes back to I think it was Music City is when he started this run he's been on. We went over it on Grip Lock where he like, I mean he's just been on a very dominant stretch before the European Open and into it to where we've had him in the top two of our power ranking for a few weeks now. But I do think that the European Open kind of or the European stretch, sorry, did help cement that. Yeah, because and all, it all depends on what the rest of the year goes. Because if it 100%. goes the way you said, 100%, then yeah, he's going to look back at Europe like those are that was my chance. Or if it flips and gives him the momentum, then I think that it was a big win for him. So yeah, it just depends on the future. But the Ricky one, real quick, the Ricky one, he showed multiple things, right? He showed his dominance of where he just completely waxed the whole field, never looked back. And then this tournament where he kind of showed the dominance at the beginning and then really, really struggled. And at a moment there, like he might've, he might've lost that tournament, but he was able to, uh, to me like this just showed that he can win no matter what he never counts himself out. And we'll see. He just posted something on Instagram. I think today talking about, he might have a popped out rib. So um, we'll see how that goes for the rest of the season. Jeez. Um, All right. 
yeah, a lot of good, a lot of good picks. Wow, do we have different picks from every single person? I think so. That is <laughs> remarkable. A plus, A plus for everybody on that one. Um, because usually we get a lot of the same. Uh, all right, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, more PDGA because we love talking about the PDGA. So, first, the PDGA changed hole sixteen at the European Open to make it softer. And now we found out they removed all the OB on the first three holes of New London for the World Championships. Are they prioritizing pace of play too heavily at the expense of these courses, or is it such a pertinent issue that the course can shed a few strokes gladly, and it's not really that big of a deal? Uh, Ross, what do you think? I think for for the New London example, I don't think it's that big of a deal. In fact, I think the the OB on those three holes was overly punishing. To, to lefty players and to, to forehand dominant players to where, especially on hole two, I mean, obviously the woods on the left on, on hole two are, are very thick, but you could just dump hyzers into there if you're afraid of that OB. While if you're a lefty, you have to throw the touchiest straight uh, or turnover shots, which I thought was overly punishing. Um, and I'm also curious if, if the OB, is it now the property line, which is deeper into the woods, or is it just you can go as far as deep into the woods on the right um, and not be OB? I'm interested to know that, but I think on a course like New London, you know, let the woods be the OB, let, let that be the natural OB. That's what makes that course uh, pretty incredible. I do think the PDGA is focusing, if they want to improve pace of play, they're focusing on the wrong issues um, in terms of difficulty of the course, maybe make the fields um, not as deep. We don't need as many players in the field at this point anymore. Um, perhaps have two or three groups and uh, people in a group instead of four. Um, and obviously the pace of play that Brody uh, likes to talk about so much in terms of this, the, the speed at which players play. There's a lot of other ways the PDJ can attack um, pace of play in these events without removing OB. If that was the reason for the change, not a fan. If the reason for the change was, hey, this is overly punishing to that left to right um, shot. So let's change it. I'm fine with that. Yeah, tr true. It is. It is not. You know, we don't know for certain if that was their motive. It just seems like kind of a trend recently. Uh, Dustin, what do you think about their their switch ups with the OB? Well, I was going to ask the question: if, if the whole sixteen at the European Open was that was that a direct quote that they said they wanted to make it softer? Because I mean, that's what they did, but it just took some of the little well, think some of the drama out of the whole. Now, I, I have a record. Uh, I don't know if y'all know about this, but I'm the only person who's never thrown out of bounds on New London. Like that's a big. I'm proud of that because I never played it, but uh, I've watched y'all play it many times on TV. So I can only speak so far, but I'm just thinking about, you know, why they specifically choose the first three holes to take away out of bounds. And the only thing that can really get in my head is they want the tournament to get off to a fast start. Maybe. And I don't mean by speed, because sometimes I think throwing out of bounds, when I throw my disc so deep in the woods, I'd rather just go to that about lines, and throw it. It's going to speed up the game a lot faster for me than digging through the woods. But in this instance, I just think they don't want their players to poop to bed. I think they're trying to keep the excitement going. Maybe that just if they start off with all these guys throwing out of bounds consistently, and that's the momentum builder at the beginning of the tournament, I think it's just not a whole lot of fun to watch. I don't want to watch a football game and, you know, first half is 3 nothing. You know, I want some action out there. I want it to get started. So with as difficult as the rest of New London can be, especially holes – I don't remember each and every one, but I know like five, six, some of those long ones where there's a lot of out of bounds, a lot of trees, long holes. I just think there's a lot of difficulty out there that um, they're trying to get the player start off on the right foot. Maybe that confidence builds, maybe that, that momentum starts built going for them and just the opportunity to score better and get the crowd into it, get the, get the fans watching and get really get them involved. You know, yeah, that's an interesting angle. Maybe they uh, they got a little scared after watching the monster course beginning and watching players shank it OB off of the tee pad over and over again at the European Open. Uh, Brody, what do you think about this? You, you're the authority on pace of play, so where you lie? Yeah, I mean, the thing that doesn't really make too much sense is you don't have to go that far back to the worlds that they had at Emporia where people were jump putting off the tee to start their world championship on hole one to avoid the OB, the Island hole or whatever you want to call it. I don't think the PDJ again, the PDJ, I don't think are like, I don't think they know what they're doing. I, I literally don't. I think there's a dartboard somewhere. Someone just blindly chucks it at the dartboard and wherever it hits. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason for it. I do know that they did, uh, from what people have been saying from the interview that was on Upshot, 
that they did mention pace of play was the main reason for changing the holes on hole 16. I haven't heard anything on why they took the OB out on hole one, two, and three. So if someone knows, if someone has Intel on what the reasoning there is, please, please let me know. Um, but that, that, that is the defense. I mean, hole two probably doesn't need it, but that is the defense of hole one and hole three. If you take the OB out of hole one and hole three, that those holes become either a birdie or a par hole. And one of the beautiful things about new London is the fact that I think almost every hole, not almost, not every, but almost every hole you can birdie it par bogey or double. And now you're basically removing that from two holes. I don't understand. Does it make sense? Um, and I don't think they know either. Yeah. I mean, the dartboard theory is always valid. It's always out there. Um, Hunter, wrap it up for us. I know you're passionate about the new London situation as well. So what do you think? Yeah, I personally, I don't think that the, I don't think, I think these are two different situations. I think hole 16, from what I understood, a uh, big part of the reason was they didn't want to approve bunker rules or get a bunch of bunker uh, rule applications from like C tiers and stuff, which is a very dumb rule. Pace of play, I can at least understand. I can still disagree with, but I can at least understand on that hole. Uh, New London, I think that I don't even know if it's a PDGA decision because the first rumor I heard about this was actually like six or seven months ago. And it was after, I believe it was Chris Dickerson, but one of the Discraft Ledgestone players played New London and said, OB needs to go on the first several holes to make it a better course. Someone told me, did you hear they're taking the OB out at Worlds for the first several holes? I said, they would never do that. That makes no sense. Here we are six or seven months later, which that would point to, it wasn't a PDGA decision. It was a, you know, Ledgestone, whoever, someone else decision. Um, and realistically, if it was pace of play, I think it's an even more worse decision as a tournament director who's run several events out here. One of the worst backups you run into is on hole two. And what we're going to do here is actually make hole one, in my opinion, play a little faster because people are going to be playing. Most of their shots just going to be up by the basket. You're going to walk over to your disc. You're going to lay up and take a par, or you're going to have a birdie putt, make that walk to hole two. And I think hole two is actually going to end up playing slower because now instead of it's just like, hey, we're going OB, this is where you went out, go, or we're dumping in there. Oh, You're going to have a lot of stuff deep in, in the woods, and yeah. we're going to be scrambling and stuff like that and playing all over. So there's actually going to be a bigger backup on two. So if pace of play was their motivation behind it, uh, I think they just actually shot themselves in the foot here. Don't you love it when disc golfers throw the disc out of bounds and then and then tell people, oh, man, that OB's got to go. Of course, isn't good. Yeah, well, like, imagine I if we had Joel know, Freeman like, out there <laughs> doing what, that. <laughs> what is the actual reasoning to saying, like, the, the – I would love to know why is hole one, two, and three better without OB. I would I love bet they, to know. I bet their I answer would be it's, it's too punishing. I can tell you I why disagree. it's better with OB, but I don't think you can tell me why it's better without it. I think hole they would two, say it's too hole punishing. Hole two, I can get behind. Hole two, I can at least understand. Like, oh, it actually makes you have to work a little bit more. Yeah, like, hole two I could, bother you, me. you might have a worse lie, you know, after your drive. If you also a super long hole, regardless. I, hole two, I can understand. One and three, it takes away the complete defense because, like, we no, were there the hole, other day, and I'm like, hole, I could literally throw a forehand and guarantee. If I hit a tree, I'll have a birdie look. And if I go over to the right, I'm going to have an easy par. And that's a player of my skill level, much less yeah, the best in the world. But hole two is still very important to have that OB on, the tee, on the tee shot. Or yeah. else people are just going to bomb drivers off the tee. And if they end up going too straight in OB, well, it's not OB anymore. If they end up going too straight, oh, well, they'll pitch out and get up and down for par. Yeah. Where it's just, again, it goes back to the idea that. Sometimes you can just put OB somewhere and it gets in the player's head that, holy crap, I can't throw over there. And they make mistakes they aren't going to make. Now players are going to come and be able to go free right off the gate. I don't like it. Well, another yeah. reason I think that it's not pace of play behind the, the new London decision is I think if it was pace of play, they would have attacked hole six. Because hole yeah. six, like you yeah, have a blind tee shot OB around the, the corner. Right. Yeah, like you have a blind tee shot around the corner with a bunch of OB. Like that's another hole that as a tournament director, you just have backups yeah. there. There's not really one a way around it. Head, one and three so are like, head scratchers. If they're I mean, if they were trying to attack pace of play, I think that's the hole they're also attacking and they didn't touch it. So I think I don't was it Ross? I think that said shrink who said shrink the 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 field. Is that I think Ross? Ross did, yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. If you stick any one of us right now in a PGA tour event, guess what's going to happen? we're going to slow down the entire tournament behind us. Guess what's yeah. going to happen at Worlds? 
If you're in pool B, whoa, buckle up, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, my what's funny to me is I've I've been talking because with worlds coming here and basically my entire extended family lives here. I have a lot of relatives that are like, oh, I've you know, they're talking to me about worlds coming because they've heard it's a big deal. And the first question they all ask is like, are you playing in the event? And I'm like, no. And they're like, oh, is it really hard to get to the event? And I have to immediately be like, no. <laughs> not not really like realistically i could play in it if i would have just like started trying last year but i have other stuff going on but it's like a hard explanation especially my great uncle's like super into golf and yeah. he hears world championships so he's thinking oh if this is like above any tournament you can imagine like that has to be crazy hard to get into and i'm like no easier no, it's than not. a lot of them yeah i mean i could i could be over in france right now competing in the olympics but i just didn't feel like it yeah, exactly. Like you hear <laughs> world championship and you're thinking like, oh, this is like the top 50 people went through like a super rigorous qualification. And this is the, it's like, no, there's like 300 some players and like the probably 150 of them are just there. So the purse is bigger. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. That purse though. Anyhow. That purse though. All right. We got a really interesting final question here before the, the final round. Uh, the first part of this question was fan submitted. And then I kind of added an additional question to, to give it a little bit of depth. Um, but the fan submitted question was, is the lack of critical media and the overwhelming buddy, buddy attitude on tour, holding players back from feeling the pressure to improve and perform better. And my question I added to that was, do you think the media plays a role and should play a role in the accountability for poor performance among players in sports, assuming it drives uh, them to be better. So a lot to unpack here, Dustin, what do you think? <laughs> you know, I think when it comes to the first part, we're talking about the buddy buddy attitude, the holding players back. I mean, I'm, yes, it's it's a problem. I don't think. I mean, I understand it's a sport where a lot of people are close, a lot of people travel together, a lot of people are around each other all the time, and you don't want um, a lot of animosity and uncomfortableness, you know, around these people because they are around each other so much. But at the end of the day, um, it's a it's a competition, it's a sport, and it's it's supposed to be head to head, you know, battles. And I made a reference to UFC one time when talking about this type of attitude on the show. And I got hit up in the comments a lot. I don't want people throwing elbows or yelling at each other, but I just want to see that fire of, you know, if you hit a good shot, I, 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 if, if I'm playing against you and you hit a good shot on me, I'm not going to smile at you and tell you a good job right at that moment. Maybe afterwards we can talk about it, but I want to just have that fire of competitiveness. Now, when it comes to the media, I think the media needs to fulfill the role of asking the tough questions, asking the hard questions, not necessarily holding the players accountable, you know, and, and, and going over the top with challenging them on how they're practicing or what they're doing, anything like that. Um, but they got to ask the hard questions, you know, asking Evelina, you know, what's going on with the putting, asking some of these players why the collapse in round three, and really somebody that's going to go have those conversations with the players that finish second and third. And, you know, I think, if you're a player and you're answering those kind of questions, I know if my boss comes in my office and, you know, challenges me about something I do, I want to have good answers. I want to be able to respond the right way. And I just don't, I just don't think there's enough challenge from that angle. I've been watching the last dance again, that, that Bulls documentary with Jordan. And that guy is such an example of how he held his teammates accountable and how he pushed them and how he just winning, winning was what he was there for, not just hanging out. And it feels like sometimes it's too much hanging out. Mm. All right, strong words, Brody. What do you think? Well, I mean, we uh, to be fair, we can't really judge disc golf to other team sports because if you think about it, you know, let's just go NFL. You've got a team of guys that are practicing at their facility all week, and they either have a team coming in and playing in their stadium, or they're flying and playing someone else's stadium. And then once that game is over, they aren't seeing those people for weeks you have people that are living in our roommates, essentially in vans for years. It's going to be a different environment. It just is going to be a different environment. When we had Jason, uh, Jason Belmonte on to talk bowling and everything. It was very, this very same thing. Now, obviously the money's gotten a little bit better where people are flying, but he was kind of mentioning too, like a lot of us at the beginning, we were just kind of driving from event to event and like, all kind of helping each other out to kind of get the thing rolling. Um, I think that's what's happening. I, now on the media side of thing, again, it goes back to the, it's tough because right now outside of the disc golf network, I don't know too many people that are doing media for disc golf full time. 
it, it's it, like just talking to uh, talking about the disc golf, not obviously we are a media company that do a whole lot of other things, but like someone that's just reporting on professional disc golf outside of disc golf network. I don't know anyone's doing it and until that happens. It's going to be really hard for someone to get away from that buddy, buddy system. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, Hunter, what do you think about the, uh, the role of the media and all this? Yeah, I think it's a, I think this is an interesting question because I think it hits on the problem, but it, just misses as well because i think the buddy buddy attitude is the problem but i don't think the media really has anything to do with it i think the media has a little bit of a motivating factor and i think that the bigger problem with the media is that like 95 percent of disc golf media that is actually being consumed is on the dgn's payroll so they can't be critical of the dgn or of players and so on and so forth um that's why i'm blocked by a lot of players is because we're one of the only ones that can and um that's a very interesting thing to be in but i think that the buddy buddy role that's actually holding players back is from the manufacturer side because where players you know you have a certain class of players that are just motivated with the mamba mentality or they they just want to win and they don't care about the money they don't care about a lot of stuff they just want to win those players are going to rise to the top and it doesn't matter what else is going on but then you have a lot of players that they need to be hit in the pocketbook to really care because they're going to just cruise along in 20th place and they're not going to be competitive because they can sit back and have manufacturers cover their expenses and stuff like that and not really have to worry about anything because that's the buddy buddy nature of the sport i think that for the sport to really grow and get more competitive that needs to come to an end to a certain extent and it's like performance needs to matter or else you're not getting paid performance needs to matter or else this contract's going to run up to where you can't sit back, be a 25th or 40th or whatever 50th player in the world and just be comfortable being there. It's like get better or go home because there's someone waiting to take your spot. That's the mentality that's not really in the sport right now. And I think it's more the buddy buddy side from the manufacturer, not necessarily from the media. Okay. Yeah. Interesting point there. Uh, Ross, wrap it up for us. What is your take on all this? Yeah, I don't I don't know necessarily if the the buddy buddy attitude of professional disc golf is holding players back. You know, outside the the top, let's say eight, maybe maybe ten players, the majority of players, the food they buy that week determine is determined by how well they play in that event. Um, it is very much about like economic survival for a lot of players on tour. A lot of players, they're you know they're not selling discs if they're not playing well. They're not making money from the manufacturer. They're not playing well. If they're not collecting uh, purse money. You know they might not be able to go on tour. I mean, I I know some players um, that were East Coast locals that have gone on tour who were like ten twenty rated, thought they could make it, literally could not afford to do it anymore. Um, so probably aren't going to be able to do it next year. So I'm not I'm not necessarily buying into the fact that like you know they're all homies, so they're not trying their hardest like they want to continue touring and they want to just be able to survive. Um, so I think they're trying their hardest. I will say that I do think that the, you know, disc golf media and disc golf fandom in general um, is a little too soft on players is a little too soft on events is a little too soft on everything where it's like, it's supposed to be a small community. We want everyone to get along and it just to be fun, but you know, the, the players are playing for tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars throughout the year. This is a big deal. And, you know, players, events, manufacturers, uh, the tour itself need to be held accountable for when they're doing things right and when they're doing things poorly. You know, the praise that the European events have uh, gotten over the last few weeks for how well they're how well they have been run is great. On the flip side, if events run poorly, people got to hear it. If players are playing poorly below expectations like Eagle has been this year, you know, with a, you know certain caveats with him, they got to hear it. Um, so I do think both media and the fans should be a little harder on players. Yeah, I, I think, and a lot of you guys kind of went uh, in the direction with this question of the kind of the tour atmosphere. I think where my brain was going and what I was kind of thinking about is, you know, he kind of referenced the, the fan that submitted this question, kind of referenced the idea that the media's critical nature would drive players to be better. And certainly you do see in other pro sports um, the idea that maybe a – pro athlete might be motivated by certain comments made by the media or other players. Um, but in my kind of, my kind of thought process was like, that is maybe a factor, but how much of a factor is that? And also is that something that the media should 
be actively trying to do? Like, is that a part of disc golf that's that's missing? Are the players not motivated enough? But I don't know. I think it is a little I, bit of a stretch. Yeah, I don't. I would disagree with that completely. I I think you either are self motivated or you're not. I don't think someone on social media saying something to you is all of a sudden going to snap you into doing something. You look at some of the greatest athletes we've seen in any sport across the thing. It wasn't like they all of a sudden just had a killer mindset or all of a sudden increased their work ethic. They, from a very young age, most of them all had that. Uh, so that's something that doesn't like just all of a sudden happen because people are starting to call you out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, would, like, I, think I would agree with that. I don't, I don't, if I hear you correctly, Hunter, when you said like there was numerous players who have blocked you on social media because they don't want to hear your takes on stuff. I mean, is that ultimately, yeah. because I mean, if they can't handle Hunter's takes, I mean, I mean, no offense, Hunter, you're not Stephen A. Smith out there blasting people and some of these other people. I mean, you're pretty respectful in all that you say. And so, I mean, if that's too much for some of these players to handle, I mean, how, how would they respond to those critical type of well, really critical type of responses? But like, who cares? Well, no, I agree. Like, I agree. I, I don't. I don't care. But no, I'm that's saying the me, player. That's, like, what? How? What is it going to do to the player? They don't care. Oh, no, I think. Well, I, but why are so many players affected by it enough to block Hunter? I mean, I just to me that's that. Well, they don't say don't anything wanna, to they, hurt my feelings. You well, know? Yeah, and I just I don't mean, think that's the way it should be. But uh, to to me, I think that it's more so the it hasn't happened. Like, uh, when players play bad then excuses are just accepted when it's like, no, you just, you played bad. Maybe your putts off for this year, maybe whatever. Yeah. Um, and historically the media has just brushed it under the rug because like, and no offense to Terry Miller, but like if I'm Terry Miller and I got to go see these people like doing smash box year in and year out, and I'm be walking with their car doing commentary. Of course, I'm not going to talk bad about them because I'm going to see them next week. And that's how disc golf media has been yeah. for so long that like when someone comes in and is critical of performance or stuff like that, then you know it's just not going to be received nearly as well but to me i think it's important media wise to call it like you see it because then when something is praised you know it's genuine because you've seen it being willing the flip side of the coin of like you you know versus it's just always yay go you good 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 then it's like well am i actually doing good or like it's the same thing of if you i don't know if you're if you're never if you're never told something's wrong, you're just always told, right, 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 good, good, good. Then like, it just doesn't feel as good versus if you have someone who's like willing to tell you the hard truth of Evelina's putt needs to get better. Then when Evelina's putt does get better and the media says it like it, now it feels much more rewarding than if everyone was just like, Oh yeah, I don't know. You know, her, something must've been off this week. Her putt just didn't look like herself. And it's like, well, it did. It's, it's been going on <laughs> two years now. It did. But yeah. I don't think it's something that the media should be, attempting to be critical just for the sake of being critical. I think it's more, I think Ross was the one who said it, or it might've been in the, the question of like keeping people accountable per se. Uh, maybe it was in the question, but like keeping people well, accountable for the good and the bad so that then both sides show. I think that's the big thing is just, is just telling to having it, having a story being told, right? If, yeah. if a player is coming out there and, and is making excuses after excuses and all of a sudden someone goes and says, Hey guys, look, the last 10 tournaments this player didn't play well. They literally made an excuse every time. The last five, they played well. They didn't make an excuse. There you go. That that gives a little more information to uh, the fans. And to answer your question or to respond to you, Dustin, about it, like, I think, again, it, it's just it's the fans, right? So if you're a huge fan of someone and you come to find out that they blocked Hunter because Hunter said something negative towards them, that is now on you to be like, do I want to buy their disc? That's the yeah. only thing that changes. Like there's people that suck in every sport. There's a ton of NFL players that aren't good people that suck and people just don't root for them, but they're still going to go out there and do their job. Like nothing really changes. So I don't, I, I don't think we need to have everyone on tour, not blocking Hunter. Some people are going to block Hunter and some people aren't. doesn't really matter. You, you, you just make the decision what you want to do block, knowing that information. Block them. Everybody block yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, we for sure all have that ability. You know, there's some people I don't care to listen to, so I don't listen to them. I just, you know, it just feels like sometimes everybody's just trying to validate validate people's feelings, you know. And and when I go out on the course and play with my wife, and I am not a great disc golfer. Some would argue that I'm not a good disc golfer. I'm a fine disc golfer for a 46-year-old man that started four years ago. Now, that's that's my category of play. And I'll go out with my wife, and she'll watch me sometimes or, or play around with me, and I'll throw a disc that's meant to flip up and turn slowly to the right and fade, you know, fade over to the basket. 
And then I throw it on the hyzer and it goes 100 feet to the left. And she looks at me with these big eyes and it's like, that was a great shot. And it just like infuriates me because I'm like, that was not, that was not a good shot on any level. Don't say that, you know, and it's just that. Uh, I feel like I've watched tournaments sometimes, even commentators, like somebody will hit a tree and it'll bounce off a tree right under the basket and they'll be like, it almost yeah, feels but, like they're like, but Dustin, also, the also, there's, a, there's also a lot of people that just have no clue. They literally just have no clue. Uh, I mean, I, I listened to the last call, the last call of the last tournament, the, uh, the, um, on one of the shots, it wasn't the last call, but on one of the holes. And again, I guess they have a different hard, like they're in the studio. They can't really see much why someone on the ground should be making the calls. But Paul basically parked the shot. Ricky then threw and the commentary was like, that is way left of Paul's. And then it landed like right on top of Paul's dick. Yeah. <laughs> so again, like at the end of the day, you got to remember too, like a lot of times people are saying stuff and they just have absolutely no idea. They think yeah. that hitting a tree and having it go out of bounds is bad luck and not a bad shot. So they're not even like trying to sugarcoat it. They literally just mm-hmm. think hitting a tree going out of bounds, bad luck. And so they're going to be like, oh, terrible break. When in fact, you should be like, wow, shanked it. Yeah, no, that's true. There you go. So there you go. All right. We're going to move on to the final topic here. Um, Brody and Hunter, uh, which of you are Hunter? Would you like to go first or second? Um, I'll take first. Okay. I wish I could um, have someone champion this for me. <laughs> I, I, gonna, wish I, could, I wish i could pick a champion why you don't believe in yourself uh i could care less about this last question <laughs> you love you know just how to get me in the mood to hand you points <laughs> like let me just let me just insult the man's question right before he reads it to me it's i'm just, just saying this question it's, it's i a beautiful care game about. i'm excited um, about it trevor <laughs> See, and like I already feel better. Maybe like kind of like Dustin was saying, I'm one of those guys who likes to, to be work for DGN. Um, all right. Well, here is the question, the one that Brody could care less about. Uh, do you believe the Pro Tour is profitable? If so, explain your reasoning. If not, do you believe they will be profitable within the next five years and why or why not? What is your outlook on their financial situation? The reason I ask this question is I think there's a lot of ambiguity. Uh, I think people that are new to disc golf and just see the structure that the pro tour has are probably like, Oh, they're kind of a big tour. I think people that are in the sport for a while might see signs of struggle. I kind of want to see what your outlook and and thoughts are on their financial situation are Hunter. Go ahead. Um, No, I don't think the pro tour is profitable as it sits currently. Um, And my logic behind this is I stick with me because I'm about to make a comparison. That is not what I mean to make Mm. in the way you're going to take it, but Let's compare the Pro Tour to Amazon, okay? Mainly because I just started reading a book about Amazon, and basically Jeff Bezos at the beginning of Amazon, not going where you think, he, for the first several years of Amazon, was able to survive because he was able to sell investors on the belief that he would one day be profitable. Um, So I think that's where the Pro Tour is right now, is they're able to sell people on this vision that it will one day be profitable. We know Todd Rainwater was a big investor. We know he gave them... X amount of years of, I want it to run, I give you a burn rate of this many years before you need to be profitable. I think that they're if they're able to, and this is what I think is going on, is basically show like, hey, we're not profitable intentionally because it is allowing us to make the live disc golf better. It's allowing us to do X, Y, and Z better with the hope of increasing to where then we can pull back expenses and show profit. So I don't think they're profitable right now, but my spin on it is I think it's intentional. I think that they could run a profitable operation if it was super necessary right now. It would just require the Pro Tour to pull back resources from certain, you know, uh, departments and maybe even pull back how good the live coverage is currently and pr- produce a worse product that could be profitable. But instead, I think that they're able to sell people on the idea of, hey, if this grows and if this continues, then 5, 10, 15 years from now, we'll be able to be profitable at a much larger scale. And that's what you're investing towards. So I think that they are not profitable, but I think it's intentional where if the rubber met the road, they could say, we're going to have to cut our production team by X. We're going to have to cut our event team by X. We're going to have to cut out the economic development or impact person uh, salary. <laughs> and that is going to lead to a profitability of X. So I think they're not profitable currently, but could be if necessary. Well, that's a valid theory. And I think that would be a relatively positive theory because, you know, if, if they're in that living in that world, then I guess there's the idea that 
you know, we don't know what a bare bones pro tour operation would look like, but it'd be better than not nothing, certainly. So, um, Brody, what is your response? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, one thing that I do think is going to be an interesting one to see what happens down the road is how Jomez is handled because that was a big acquisition by them. I think it was smart in the sense of like, now they basically have the market of their content and the post. Um, I, I think it was smart in that way. I do know they probably spent a lot of money on basically buying out Jomez. But my question here is like, I think Jomez, a lot of the money that comes into Jomez, I believe is through like their Patreon. And if you ask me right now, like, hey, Amazon just came out with a Patreon. Are you going to join it? No. Apple just came out of the Patreon. Are you going to join it? No. Sony just came out of the Patreon. Like Patreon is kind of like an up and coming or almost like a creator, right? Like if you're a creator and you make content that people love, you create a Patreon that you make exclusive content for them. It doesn't really get the vibe for like long term. And so that is something that that's a huge influx on money going into Jomez, which I guess now is going to the Disc Golf Pro Tour. It will be interesting to see how that goes down the road because eventually you got to think people are not going to continue to pay for that at a certain point, I would assume. Um, and as far as like, I, I think the big question is like, I don't think if you looked at like their statements right now, I don't think they're in the green overall. But what I would love to to know and hopefully is like, are they actually starting to make money from like a week to week basis? Because if they're starting to chip away at their debt, then that's a great thing. If they're going more and more into debt, then that's a really bad thing. Because I think yeah. it's been long enough to where they should be making money. Not necessarily out of debt, but should be working their way towards that. Yeah. And, you know, it's an interesting trajectory they had because, you know, you have the start of the Pro Tour back, what, 2015, 16, Hunter, 16? Yep. 16. So the pro tour begins at this point. It's really an underdog to the national tour. They introduce live coverage. People hate it. It almost seemed like kind of a villain in the disc golf scene. They build momentum over time of eventually become the primary tour in disc golf. Things are going up, up, up. Uh, we have the COVID boom of disc golf. They're making all these new hires. Things look, things look really good for the pro tour. And now in a few years, you've had, um, kind of this plateau of disc golf that people probably should have realized was going to happen. So maybe there was some overspending. And then you also have all these legal battles they were fighting last year that drained them of resources. So you have this really weird hard reset that they did and it's tough to say, okay, did they trim the fat? Are they back to where they were, where maybe they were close to profitable or slightly profitable? Uh, are they, were they never there in the first place? It, it's, it's just interesting to, to think about. And it also, you know, like Hunter mentioned, at the end of the day, you have to think there's enough people that want to watch disc golf and enough pros that want to play disc golf um, that if they had to run the most bare bones version of their product, they, they surely you could make money, right? Because you can sell the subscription at the end of the day uh, once you've invested in all the equipment and, and, and the limited staff that you would need. So uh, it's just fascinating to see. And, and you know, we'll probably... We'll only find out if we see a really big headline someday that says Pro Tour declares bankruptcy. That's really mm. the only way you, we would find out. So That would be crazy for a lot that of would people. Be, yeah, it would be very crazy uh, for the disc golf scene. But who knows? Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, yeah, that would be fascinating. Look, comment down below what you think about the Pro Tour's uh, financial situation. Um, or if you have insider info, just DM me. Just come, Ooh, straight, yeah, come yeah, straight yeah. to the source. We'd love to hear about it because I, I feel like it's something of all the things I hear kind of behind the scenes in disc golf, you get little little snippets here and there, but not a ton. Um, but Hunter, you are a victor today. Congratulations. Your warm light. It, it just, it, it, you know, and it matches your color nameplate too. I do really, I really, I really like that about your setup. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, I will say just, to like piggyback on what Brody was saying, I think that there is a decent chunk of people that still don't know the Jomez Pro Tour acquisition thing. In my opinion, I think that's probably why the Disc Golf oh. Pro Tour hasn't rebranded Jomez fully. Because yeah. I think that when I said something on the coffee break about 
uh, which is a thing I do every Tuesday morning. I was talking literally about what the pro tour should do with Jomez. And I was getting several comments of people that like either had no clue or were like and, just hearing about it or just it slipped their mind. And they're like, oh, I completely forgot that happened. So yeah, and you know what Brody makes an interesting point because Hunter and I were talking about this the other day and we were like, why didn't the pro tour start phasing out the Jomez branding sooner, or at least introducing more pro tour network, whatever branding into Jomez. And maybe it's to protect their individuality and their Patreon as a part mm-hmm. of that. Maybe the Patreon, the I, catalyst also, for that. I wouldn't check this because Brody brought it up. Patreon. They make so much off of Patreon. Jomez used to have their Patreon. Like they didn't, they never had the amount they made on Patreon public, but the they members. had the number of patrons they had public. They have hidden mm-hmm. that yeah. since the pro tour acquisition. So. I bet they're, I bet they're protecting that Patreon because Brody's right. You don't, you don't hand over the Patreon money to the, to the ginormous corporate, uh, entity you give it to when you go to wendy's creator, and they're like hey do you want to round up for charity heck no <laughs> Jay, you make billions of dollars i'm not gonna give you a write-off i'll donate charity myself yeah yeah it, that's Just by the way that, if you do that guys do not do that they literally yeah. use your money to make a huge write-off for them so do not do that there you go yeah, Brody donate it yourself but if you guys want charity. to round up next time you buy something at foundationdisc.com, we will donate it to charity. So definitely I don't look think we doing offer that. that. We don't offer that. We do <laughs> have a tip yet. option Not that yet. goes straight to Silas. 20% tip. Just, I think you know, we should. Yeah, I think we should do up. a tip a tip button just Would for Would you like Silas. to leave a tip for the staff? <laughs> for having to, having to deal with, with, uh, with tour life every week. Yeah, I Patreon is mean, such a weird thing, though, because, uh, well, I mean, just – just money in general is a weird thing is when you as like an individual start showing that you have a lot of money, people are less willing to pay you. Well, I think yeah. it all depends on what you're doing with your Patreon, which I don't, Joe I just looked and it, I don't fully know what they're, what they do with it. It didn't seem like a ton of like exclusive content. Cause if you're providing a product on Patreon, right? It's like, yeah. Oh, we'll use us for example. Like, Oh, you pay this amount, you get, an exclusive weekly podcast you get this bonus content you're like you're buying digital goods that's different than like oh pay to support us grassroots yeah. which is what joe has well, kind of started on and it's when like, you were right. your name your name goes at the end of the video and that's right that. and when you were supporting joe prior you felt like you were giving to this very important entity in disc golf that was Correct. helping the sport forward and they were all on their own and it's not Correct. like that anymore yeah. And that's what I'm saying. If, if all the people at careful, Disc Golf man, Network and DGN on Disc Golf Pro Tour all of a sudden are wearing Rolexes and flying private all over the place, you no longer feel the okay. need to be like, well, I don't think they need my money to like Better not help, see a Rolex. help them grow. Yeah. I want yeah. to know what everybody in the Pro Tour drives and their um and their mortgage payments. And then I will well, decide I don't think anyone's I doing that right now, but I'm just saying. That's just kind of just how it is. You're less likely to give money to someone that yeah. has a crap ton of money. It's all about the perception. All right. Well, uh, that was it for this week's episode. Um, I did notice one of the the top comment on last week's video, man, that people failed to mention, uh, was that people seem to be on board of with the live streaming uh, option for uh, the show. Not one of the top comments, though. No. Uh, it was at the time I looked. The three top comments were there needs to be a Disc Golf Pro Tour debate night where it's all tour players and then the other top comment was i'm going to keep commenting until yuli is on debate night well, those that's were fair. yeah that's fair that, that and that the third one was complaining fair. about me complaining about the tree being random which looking back on it that was a good complaint it was not a random tree in the fairway that was big of you to admit it um if you want to submit any topics for next week's episode make sure to scan the qr code on the screen or click the link in the description we've been getting a lot of submissions the last few weeks which i really appreciate um always helps me out and uh we had a great one on the uh show this week so continue to submit those questions and uh hopefully we'll include some next week we are um yeah we're moving forward in the, in the debate night season right now we're getting into the later half of the season not too many weeks left so enjoy it while you got it uh because once we hit the off season there'll be no more debate night so yeah but you know, what's, you know what's coming back oh i know <laughs> story time with foundation <laughs> the off-season podcast we'll see you next week